Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Welcome to a really special online lecture. Um, my name is Nakama Brody. I'm with the Witt Center for Journalism, where I also coordinate the South African chapter of a international program called Safety Matters, looking at safety and journalism. And I head up the Witt's Justice Project. Recently in South Africa, we've been extremely fortunate to be joined by American professor Ilana Newman from the University of Tulsa. Ilana is a professor of psychology with extensive experience dealing with trauma. Um, and she's done a lot of work on trauma and journalism. And she's been in South Africa hosting a number of workshops looking at um, safety, journalism, and also safety and first responders. And we recently ran a workshop for first responders where I think in quite a unique way, we brought together journalists Journalists, paramedics, police officers, search and rescue officers, forensic pathology teams, um, chaplains, social workers, a, a whole mix of people who are often the first responders to a scene or who have to deal with the trauma that's involved in some kind of a mass uh, trauma incident, a mass disaster, something similar to that. And we hope that this will be the start of many engagements between different first responders, including journalists. Um, Ilana was talking at the workshop about psychological first aid and what we've done today, because we weren't able to get through the entire program on our designated workshop day, is we thought we'd host an online lecture that people can watch in their own time and you will be able to send us questions afterwards, you know, even though it will be um, asynchronous, but we'll be happy to engage with anybody who has further questions. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll hand over to Ilana, who will introduce you or reintroduce you if you were at the workshop to the concept, and we'll share resources and, and really quite a robust discussion along the way. So thanks, Ilana. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, and in general, um, it was such a delight to, to run these workshops, so I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that we were able to do that. All right, I'm going to pull up my... Um, Slide. Let me start. And today we're going to talk about a psychological first aid. Okay. And there are many versions of psychological first aid. There's some for the clergy, there's some for schools, there's some that have been created for the World Health Organization, some for the medical corps. And um, I want to tell you about why we want psychological first aid. Um, psychological first aid is something that allows a responder of many different kinds of responders. Um, there are many different roles during mass public health events. And learning psychological first aid may help you in your tool cut, toolkit for yourself. But it should not substitute for your particular role and function during an event. It might help you with peer support. It might help you understand volunteers on the site and how to use them. And before we begin, I just want to show you the manual. And in fact, um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so that you can see the manual. Is that possible? Do you, or can you do that on your end? Yeah. I think you should have it now. So this is the this is the cover. This is the psychological first aid field operations guide. Um, released by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network in the United States. So this is what the cover looks like. And um, when you see Ilana's slides, there's also a link available to this, so you can download it online. Um, and let me just scroll to the very end. Um, Thank you. The, let's see if I can do this. I'm one. particularly excited about all of the appendices um, in here that, goes even a little further down. Uh, go, yeah, even go further this way. Um, there's a checklist, there are worksheets, but even more so, there are these lovely handouts that you can provide people on site, which has all sorts of tips, like parenting tips for toddlers, ways to help your infants, ways to help your teenagers. So there's it is chock full of things for you, things you can give away, things for, you can give to parents during uh, a mass disaster. So I just wanted to make you aware, lots of tip sheets. Tips that you for can relaxation, of. relax, how to lead a child through a breathing exercise. Okay, so a lot of really practical examples there. I'm going to stop sharing now, and you can go back to your slideshow. Okay. 
Yes. So, um, and I'll have them again uh, on my slides at the end, but I just want to make sure that everybody knows that those are there and available for you. Um, just so your slides are not showing at the moment. So. Yes, not yet. Okay. Just I am sure. aware of that. Great. We're back. We're back. Okay. So the goal for today is at the end, I'm really going to do an introduction and let you know it's what the essential aspects of psychological first aid are. Um, so you know what it is, you know a little bit about how to implement them. I want you to start thinking that we're not going to really talk about adapting them in diverse settings and appreciate the importance of the those giving psychological first aid. And at the end, I want to talk a little bit as we started to talk about together about how you can enhance your own provider care for during and after disaster care. So that'll be a separate part. So today we're going to talk about the eight steps of psychological first aid. That's contact and engagement, safety and comfort of people who are on site, stabilizing people who need to be stabilized, getting information you need to then offer practical assistance or connection with social support, providing coping, and then linking with any kinds of collaborative services. We are not going to do a simulation today, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about provider care. And I realize as I'm doing this, that these are my older slides, uh, which will have some exercises on it that we're probably going to skip. Now, psychological first aid was first developed by the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder in the US, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Um, and the key authors are listed here, and it was supported by several organizations. And the reason it was developed is that the information that we had showed that something called psychological debriefing, which was being used after disasters to prevent PTSD, was not in fact preventing PTSD, um, and in fact might have been getting people worse um, and promoting PTSD. So there was an absence of what to do and to try to figure out what needed to be done. And a lot of the major um, trauma organizations and disaster uh, organizations said, we don't have anything for mental health. We need to figure out what to do to provide mental health when there is a mass disaster. And I am working um, in what I'm providing you a little bit with some adaptions of it. There is uh, the Red Cross has its, has a slight adaption to psychological first aid. The Medical Reserve Corps has an adaptation. So depending on which organization, there are slight differences, but I'm just going to present the general. And in order to be a psychological first aid provider, you basically have to have a couple of capacities. You have to be able to work under chaotic and unpredictable environments. So um, if you are someone who needs a lot of control of the environment, if you need a lot of order, this is not the kind of work that you should do. And in fact, we have found that people have difficulty. You need to be able to work really quickly to figure out what does somebody need. You need to be able to provide services based on context, intervention, and make decisions quickly. And you have to be able to tolerate sort of intense distress and reactions. So I often go out in, this, in the site of, of um, tornadoes, because I live in a place where there are lots of tornadoes, and you have to really be able to sort of move with the situation. And what we find is that many of you are, um, first, are first responders who are used to this kind of stuff. But when you're looking for volunteers to help with the mental health part, um, one of the hardest parts is that mental health providers are not used to working um, in activities that aren't mental health or emergency rescue activities. So a lot of the times, for example, when I am doing psychological first aid, I'm giving out water, I'm assessing damage, I'm being told to, I'm sweeping, I'm doing things that are not mental health-like. And sometimes that can be really problematic for some providers who are used to not doing whatever needs to be done. Um, one has to be able to work with diverse cultures, ethnic groups, developmental levels, and faith backgrounds and one needs to be able to take care of themselves. So that's what we look for when we're looking for people who want to give help at the site of a disaster, who want to provide the psychological first aid. Now, when I talk about a disaster, I'm using the term in the US, which is any type of mass trauma event, public health emergency or crisis. 
And psychological first aid and the tips that I'm giving here comes from a lot of, of places. It comes from disaster research. It comes from the general knowledge we have about how people respond to traumas in general, and then specifically to disasters. There were a lot of also expert consensus meetings. I participated in one um, with NATO um, in Ukraine several years ago, but we tend to have consensus conferences where people get together and say, okay, here's the best practices. It comes from years of experience collectively, it comes from a little bit of program evaluation, a little bit of feedback we've heard from people after disasters. So that's really where our knowledge base is. It is very hard to study disasters from a mental health perspective um, because they happen suddenly, getting all of everything up to date. Um, some people have taken advantage of having studies in place already when a disaster hits a community and then doing follow-up. But the research base specifically on disasters is not as advanced as the therapy literature on disasters, um, on trauma. Now, if you forget everything else I say, this is probably the thing to know. And this is the thing for first responders to know too, is that there are basically five empirically supported early intervention principles. And Hopfall got together with others for an expert consensus meeting. And what we know is that the mental health things that we need to try to always keep in mind when we're intervening is the safety of the community. We need to try to create a common environment as best you can amid chaos. Try to make people feel connected. A trauma and a disaster dislocates people. It lo dislocates them from their home, from others, and anything that you can do to create a sense of community or connectedness in any of your interventions is really key. Giving people a sense of control. A disaster means that people are out of control. They have lost their agency. So any way in which you can communicate a sense of individual agency or community agency is important. So even being able to ask people to help you with the disaster response, where, hey, you know, even in your roles, oh, hey, we need people to clear out. Can you send that information out? Ways to get people involved and feeling like they have some agency, giving people a sense of hope. So safety, calming, connectedness, efficacy and hope. Those are the empirically supported early intervention principles. And anything that you can do early on in your roles as first responders to uh, do that will help the mental health of your communities that you're serving. And anything that your your psychological first, uh, psychological first aid providers can do, I'm always thinking about that. When I'm in a community, when I'm sweeping up, when I'm handing water out, what can I do that gives a sense of safety? What can I do that gives a sense of calming? How can I connect people? Have you talked to your neighbor when I'm at a tornado site? Um, what is it that would be helpful? Uh, how can I get people to help me uh, read things out or reach out to their neighbor and instill a sense of hope? Another part of safety is making sure that the information that you provide is accurate. So again, these are the sort of the principles that I come back to time and time again when I am in an emergency situation. Now, these are the eight stages or core actions of what psychological first aid is. And I say that there are eight actions. They don't all have to be done. A few of them do. Um, they don't have to be done all of the, you know, in this exact order. Typically, you want to do contact and engagement, safety and comfort first. And then you need to figure out which of the other things need to happen. You might, once you get information, go immediately to linking. You might at some point want to provide practical assistance. But you'll see as we go through it, they don't all have to be in order. It's not that rigid a model. But the idea is connect with someone and engage. Provide safety and comfort. If they need to be stabilized, you stabilize. You get information. Then you figure out what do they need practically. Or is it that they need connection? Is it they need coping information, or is it they need links, or is it they need all of that? And I will go through each of these core actions. So what is psychological first aid? It is a formed modular approach to assist children 
children, adolescents, adults, and families in the immediate aftermath of disaster and terrorism. One of the things that psychological first aid also uh, did was it united the literature on adults and kids. It used to be that we had interventions for adults and we had interventions for kids. And this particular approach combines all of that. And I, what I like about that as well is that it fits in with many cultures and it means that people are dealing with sort of the whole community at once. So it's a modular approach to assist children in the aftermath. Its goals are not to prevent psych PTSD or other difficulties that come after trauma. The principal actions are to make sure that people are safe and secure, to get them connected to resources, to reduce acute stress reactions, to foster the natural coping that people do, and the natural resilience. We have moved away from thinking about interventions that prevent long-term difficulty, psychological difficulty, we are now about fostering natural coping and resiliency, and we are not thinking about preventing pathology. And that's very different. And that's very different also for mental health professionals who want to do this kind of work, because it, it is not about preventing psychopathology. It's about enhancing active coping and restoration. So it's designed to reduce the initial distress caused by traumatic events and to foster that short and long-term adaptive functioning. And as I'm speaking, those of you who have roles that are life-saving roles, you might be thinking about, okay, how can I add a little hope into what do I do? How can I add a little security if there's time? If you're, How can I do those things? And it's basically for anyone who's experiencing acute stress reactions or who appear to be at risk for significant impairment in functioning. It's delivered by da disaster response workers who provide early assistance, including, if your role allows for it, first responders, mental health professionals, school professionals, religious professionals, clergy, disaster volunteers, health and public health officials. Pretty much anybody can deliver it if it is not interfering again with those particular roles. And the other thing is it should be done in an incident command structure. One of the things we see in disasters is that people, you need to secure the site, right? You don't want everybody there in the community descending. So however that works in your community. In my community, we have started to train people in psychological first aid and accredit them, so to speak, or at least give them little badges and practice so that when there's an event or they work under Red Cross or they work under a community thing called a medical response. So we figured out local ways to gather volunteers that are trained, that are organized, that can become part of your incident command structure. And I don't know if you do that here in, in Africa, but you might have something like that to get those volunteers all coordinated to work with the official first responders. Um, do you have a question or response? Yeah, Ilana, I was just going to say, I'm going to try and see if I can do... Um both of us, so we can see both of us in the slideshow on the side. So I think it depends on the organization, but what I really like about this so far, and I think, I mean, it might be interesting to consider the role of journalists um, who are often there, because again, you, you mentioned that this shouldn't interfere with your work, but I often say to my journalism students is that you are human first. Um, and when you're confronted, particularly before the stabilize stabilization of a situation, I think the imperative is to be human first and then be a journalist, you know, so make sure that the person isn't bleeding out. Um, and and I really like this expression of kind of the delegation of duties. But what, what I really thought was important is this is a modular approach that allows you to sort of pre-plan and pre-identify roles that you might be asked to assume. And just by that modularization, which essentially delegates thinking about things under a central command structure, it makes the incident less overwhelming because I think that's the challenge when you have a mass event or you have people who are very afraid is that it becomes overwhelming. And maybe one of the important points here is how do we all connect with that central command structure, an IMS, you know, incident management, something? Um, or if we don't have a central structure, can we make one? Um, you know, because again, sometimes there's many different agencies that arrive, different people with different incidents, maybe the official agencies aren't the first to arrive. 
And I think that the best advice I ever got about managing scenes like this some years ago was panic slowly. Um, and um, and with all of these things is if you can you delegate and can you centralize so those two things so that you all know what the other is doing and I really do feel um, it will be important I think for the journalism community particularly as we're looking at growing numbers of sort of mass mass disaster incidents really globally or the growing frequency of those is how do how do journalists fit into this and I've had some discussions with the Red Cross about that before and other agencies because I don't think journalists plan as much as the others do. So perhaps if we do have other first responders listening is we'd love to be invited to your scenarios. Can we be part of your scenario planning? Um, because the other thing that we also see is journalists and uh, spokespeople have a role to play even at the disaster site is these are people who talk. You can tell them to talk for you. Go and tell them to share a message. That's important. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you to carry on there now, but I'm, I'm really enjoying the breakdown of this because it already gives me a sense of potential control over an uncontrolled situation. Thank you. And there's a couple things that I'll just respond to. Um, it is always nice to invite journalists to be part of tabletops or simulations or drills. And one of the issues becomes journalists sometimes want to cover those things and not be in dual roles. So one of the suggestions that's worked quite well is to invite a news agency or journalists to some of them to participate and some of it to cover. So that that way, both the needs of journalists can be done. So for example, TV takes up more space than other things. Figuring out where do you place journalists so that survivors have some privacy, but also access to journalists. And some of them do want that access. So having them be both part of it, but also inviting someone to cover your drills as news sources, that's number one. And number two, you know, I also share that perspective that, um, it is a journalist's job to uh, to cover and to be a watchdog and to explain what is happening during an unfolding disaster. But until someone else is there, if there's no one else to perform a life-saving duty or to calm people down, then it is the job of the citizen to do that until the other people come in that official role. And so some of these skills can be very helpful. And these skills can also be helpful in just helping you de-escalate the situation um, and help to serve all those responders. Um, so, so I think that's important. And there are many different ways to do pre-planning. And I think it's just a matter of thinking about all the sources. You know, there's been a lot of work done in disasters just on building community resiliency. And part of that is also even just inviting the major businesses in your community to be helping you with this pre-planning. And as climate change occurs, as we're going to have more climate-related disasters, planning, planning, planning is, I think, really important. And including as many stakeholders into your incident command that you can. You can't plan for everything, but you can plan for some things. So I think it's really important to think about that. And I told this story, so this will be a repeat, but um, after you had some temporary housing, for folks who were relocating because of um, Hurricane Katrina and the disaster that happened. And people were bused all over the US to other communities. And in our community, one of the things that we were shocked by is that um, as we were securing, and it was, a, it was a, an, an area that was actually used by our military, the training base that uh, was repurposed because it wasn't active to house people temporarily who who were dislocated. Um, what we were surprised to find out was it was our drug dealers who were ready uh, to meet people coming off the bus, a new market. And we were not prepared for that, but fortunately, because we had a coordinated response with police, with everyone else, we were able to figure out a way to keep folks safe and somewhat distance from all the drug dealers who were descending upon greeting their new market who were tired and distressed and have been traveling. So just even thinking about, you never know what's going to happen, but if you have an organized community, you can respond to whatever curveballs uh, occur in your community. Um, and because you've built relationships, and I think that's one of the things that I was so impressed with, and I hope that you will continue to do, whether it's journalists, whether it's each group, is that the more that you can build community beforehand, 
the easier it is to respond to a public health emergency. And I know everybody's busy, it's very hard to do, but the more that you can create those connections, the easier it is. And we know that trauma breaks connections. So the stronger you can make your connections early on, the more essential it is. Okay, so PFA is intended to be delivered in the immediate aftermath of a disaster. This is not long-term. This is what do you do? How do you do it? And how do you make it happen? And it can be delivered pretty much anywhere, in shelters, in schools, uh, in hospitals, in triage areas. Um, sometimes you'll need mental health people to support the medical folks. While they're triaging, you can triage the people who are concerned. We know that often during toxic exposures or radiation, what you have descending in the hospital is the worried, not the people who have been exposed. And we don't need the medical personnel to be triaging those people. You could use people who have psychological first aid to help triage those folks. So it really can be done in family assistance centers. It can really be done anywhere. It uses evidence-informed strategies. I think it's a strength. None of this is proven. And I have to be very clear about that. There is no a randomized control trial that has shown that psychological first aid uh, calms people by this percentage. This is a evidence-informed strategy. It involves that modular approach. It's basic information gathering. It's very concrete. What I talked about before that I like is it has a developmental framework so that folks who understand kids can uh, influence sort of the developmental thing. It attends to culture, and it has all of those great handouts. The disadvantage, I guess I would say, is at this point we have um, some satisfaction surveys, but we don't have evidence saying that, yes, indeed, this works. Because it's very hard to do research on what is it is if our goal here is, as we said, is to basically reduce initial distress. Well, how do you measure that? And how do you measure, how do you foster short and long term adaptive functioning? So the research base, it has some limitations, although people are collecting data on it and we haven't seen that it's problematic. Um, when delivering psychological first aid, the most important thing to do is observe first. And this is why actually journalists like it, first responders like it, police like it, because it uses that skill of observing. What you need to do is observe what's happening, ask simple, respectful questions. This is not a jargon thing. It is not, uh, I am greater than thou. It is about being patient, responsive, and sensitive, and it is strength-based. So the goal is to see what needs to be done, to act quickly and quietly and kindly with a strength-based perspective. When you're delivering psychological first aid, the things to avoid are making assumptions. You don't assume anything, and you do not assume that everyone will be traumatized. I hear that time and time again. The research on trauma shows that while many people are exposed to traumas across their lifespan, the majority of people do fine. And that's what's re remarkable. Um, the stats show that even though trauma happens quite a bit, most people survive. That doesn't mean that it, that it was meant to happen, but most people do quite well in spite of exposure. We are not even talking about symptoms here. I never talk about symptoms or disease or diagnoses. We are talking about people having some reactions to mass events, and this is not about talking down to people. So. That is very important. And again, as I said, when I've been training over the years, sometimes I find that uh, clinicians and physicians have a harder time because they have to get out of that medical hat. And they're just talking to people who are having reactions. That's all it is. And so you don't want to make assumptions or assume the worst. And for those people who do therapy, which is not everyone, but a few of you in the room, I'd like to make the distinction between psychological first aid and therapy. Psychological first aid is on immediate coping, and it's not about getting into the details. We're not trying to create a trauma narrative. We're not trying to debrief. That is not what we're doing. It is on immediate coping. And it turns out that, in fact, talking in detail about it is likely to increase stress and anxiety. Um, and 
immediately after is not the time to do that. It's the time. You're, never, you're probably not going to see the person again. It's the time to say, hey, what do you need right now? What can I do for you? And send them on their way. Um, I'm just going to have of you who don't do therapy, you don't even need to look at this. But for those of you who do, there's really a difference. Psychological first aid might be stabilization for acute circumstances. You're talking to survivors, whereas therapy is a long-term intervention where the beneficiaries are clients. Um, so for just to give you an example, um, a child is playing with toys. If you were a therapist, you'd be interpreting that. But if you're a psychological first aid provider, you're basically using play to get that kid back to normalcy and make them feel a little safe. So that just gives you a sense of sort of the fear. All right. So that's what psychological first aid is. Now I'm going to show you how you can do it. The first thing you need to do is you need to actually go up to someone and say, hey, I'm Alana. My job is to help people uh, with immediate needs right here and now. Uh, what can I do for you? It is how do you contact the person? So we're going to talk about that core action of contact and engagement. So basically, establish a connection. Introduce yourself, describe your role, and then ask permission to talk, explain your function, and ask what you need. Again, hi, I'm Alana Newman. I'm working with the Red Cross today, and my job here is to talk to people um, and see if they need anything. Would you like to talk right now? Is there anything I can do for you? Straightforward and simple. I'm, I don't say I'm a therapist. I don't say that I'm here to like get into your deepest needs. Hi, I'm here. My job is to support all the first responders here today. And I'd like to know if there's anything I can do that could be helpful to you today. So we, in our session, talked about this example, but I'll just give you this example. I'm a female survivor sobbing by myself. You just heard from another relief worker that I was notified that my husband died in a fire. When you approach me, I have, I can't stop. I have troubled speaking because I can't stop crying. What would you do? Would you initiate physical contact? And basically what I'd want to say here is that, you know, hugging personal contact varies from person to person. And if you're not familiar with a person, you shouldn't use touch. You don't want to approach too closely. You might not even want to look the person in the eye. But you could ask someone at some point, do you want? What is it that you need right now? It looks like you're really upset. What is it that would be helpful to you right now? So, again, thinking about those roles, thinking about the cultures you're working in, thinking about, is this a culture where there's a family spokesperson? What is that person's cues? What can I do for you? It looks like you're really upset. May I just sit with you for a while? And maybe breathe. I'm just going to sit with you and keep you company while you, while you cry. Is that okay with you? Making contact. Introducing yourself. That's it. Thinking about your gender and the person's gender. What would be appropriate? What wouldn't? Based on the cues you're getting. All you're doing is reaching out. It turns out that for many people, this is much harder to do than it sounds, which is sort of getting comfortable with this. And in a full workshop, we'd practice that. Many of you who have a role, it's much easier, right? I'm a firefighter. I'm with a, I'm with the police force. Hi, I'm with so-and-so. My job is to secure the scene. This is a little different because it's like, hi, I'm here. What is it that I can do for you? So contact and engagement. The next step and again, it's a step, but it's also part of all of it is to enhance immediate and ongoing safety and provide physical and emotional comfort as appropriate. So for example, when I'm at a disaster site and I notice that they're children uh, and they're looking directly at something that's like blown up or damaged, I try to actually just move them so that they're not facing all of that uckiness. That's a way of creating safety. There are lots of ways to create safety and comfort, to move people away from upset people. When I was in Haiti, um, there was a psychotic person, presumed to be psychotic, somebody who had delusions, who was yelling and screaming. Scared, it appeared. That person was scaring people more than the event. And they also had beliefs about demon possession and didn't really understand mental 
health illness. They thought the person was possessed. Um, they also thought that the earthquake was due to, to demons and ill doing. So again, and getting people trying to calm that person down helped calm the community. So I want you to think about safety and comfort in a very global way. Journalists provide safety and comfort by communicating to the community what's going on. You, in your roles, may see them as a pain in the neck, but they can be providing safety and comfort by telling people what's going on so they don't come to the scene and get in the way. There are lots of ways that we think about this core act. In the psychological first uh, uh, first aid responder role, it's first of all, are they physically safe? Is there something they're going to fall into? Is there a fire coming at them? It's providing information about what you know, accurate information. Okay, right now we don't know what's happening, but we're bringing all the people and their families to such and such place. Offering physical comfort. It could be something as simple as water, blankets, clothing. It can be offering social comforts and links to other people. You know, I don't know what's going on, but would you sit here together with Mr. So-and-so, Mr. So-and-so, this is so-and-so, we're going to come right back to you. Maybe the two of you can talk. It's protecting from additional trauma and potential trauma reminders. So like I said, not necessarily seeing if you're reviving, if somebody's being revived, can you get the person away so you don't see that? Can you get them away from dead bodies? Can you get them to not see certain things? It may be the conversation about um, should they be watching or on social media at this very moment? I know you want information. What is the information you need? Do we need to have the radio on right now? Okay, you want the radio on because you want to find out what happened to your so-and-so. Okay, but even just having that conversation. Um Ilana, I wanted to ask, I was going to save this to the end, but I think maybe this is also time to discuss it, is often the role of a journalist is there's somebody who survived a traumatic incident. They are now hopefully in a physical place of safety, but they're very upset. And you spoke previously in that, in during the making contact point about um, this, the PFA model is not to make them go deep back into the event. It's just to say, what do you need right now? But journalists often want people to recount the event. And I was wondering how perhaps that creates maybe a conflict in terms of we want to look after the well-being of the, the survivor, of the person. We don't want to re-trigger unnecessary trauma. At the same time, it's very hard as a journalist to tell a story without survivor stories. And, and there is obviously that negative kind of image of journalists, you know, shoving the microphone in the face of somebody who's just lost family members in a mass bus accident or something um, and saying, how do you feel? And, and I wonder how those journalistic practices, because this is also why I think other first responders also don't always like journalists at the scene because they feel like they um, are interfering. And I'm, I'm wondering about this sort of psychological interference. So if you're a journalist and you, you're at a, a mass event, a mass incident, um, how can you perform some of your roles, get information from survivors without making them really go back into that very traumatic incident? Um, I'm not sure if it's possible. Well, I think it, it depends. So when I do trainings like this on how to cover disasters, just journalists, um, there are a couple of principles that I have in mind. First of all, um, when it, breaking news is breaking, you you do need to know what just happened, who, what, where, when, why. You need to know what happened. But often, journalists ask those questions when they already know who, what, where, when, and why already. So the question that I ask journalists to think about is what can this person provide for you that's newsworthy at this point in time, because at the beginning, you may need that. What just happened? Where were you? You know, tell me. But often they ask those questions when they don't need that information. So it's what unique information can this person provide? I see you're coming from this direction. Were there any bullets? You know, are you safe? Did you hear any sounds? Asking a specific question that helps tell the story that is not there. I, especially important when you interview children. What is it that a child can offer you? What is it that you need to know that's going to help you tell the story? So I think that as journalists think about what is the news purpose um, and ask permission and say, hey, I know you're on your way here. You're in a rush. I'm, I'm trying to get information. Can you tell me this the basic thing that I need to know to tell the public? So explain why you're doing it. And can I talk to you later? And even maybe giving them their, your card. 
Yep. But those kinds of things, I think, are the most important. And I think that first responders would appreciate that as well because they're they're asking the questions that actually improve reporting, improve public communication. Yes. And some two very key questions that I think everybody can relate to, which is, can I talk to you and are you safe? Um, to to ask those, because you can even record that, even that becomes part of the document. But those are very important questions. And if you ask those in advance, um, then you can continue to have a conversation or not, depending on the response. But exactly, how what does this add to your coverage of the incident or the disaster? Right, I'll I'll let you get back to the slides. Thank you. Right, and and, and the context in that in that uh, in what phase you are of information gathering for that information. Okay, so. Again, this is just an example. You're working in a shelter uh, operated by a local church after a wildfire threatens homes in a nearby area. You hear mixed reports on the status of the fire. You're with people who are anxious. 500 people are currently in the shelter, up to 300 more expected. If you are a psychological first aid provider, what would you be doing? You'd be providing information. We know more people are coming. You'd be thinking about safety. Is the shelter at capacity? Do you need to get medical folks there? Is there enough water, clothing, and food for people? You might be starting to think about how can we recruit volunteers to help the staff? So you are behind the scenes. This is providing psychological first aid. You are part of the team supporting the responders. And you might be identifying people who are emotionally overwhelmed and giving them comfort. That is what something might do, somebody might do. This also raises the issue of unaccompanied unaccompanied children. Often in a disaster site, there are unaccompanied children. And each, again, if you've planned for it, you have a plan for what do you do with those children? Um, but you find out, okay, this is a child. Is there a parent around? And then you find out who is the appropriate authority. And then you also tell the child, okay, it sounds like we don't know where your parents are right now. now we're going, I'm going to find out who's going to take care of you. Here's what you can expect, and here's how we're going to keep you safe. And this should be part of every community plan. And again, it's about planning and then having that information available to the people on site and telling everyone in all your roles, knowing what are you going to do with unaccompanied children? This should be part of your tabletops, part of your simulations, thinking about what do you do with children? What do you do with people who are acutely bereaved? This is, makes everybody nervous. But it's important to know that you need to listen carefully with sympathy, to know cultural norms, know that grief reactions really vary among people. And even you may need to tell families, you know, people deal with grief differently right now and you all need space for that. So there are handouts on here's some things to know about grief. It's understandable. It's expected that you're freaked out. It's okay to use the deceased person's name. And it's okay to tell people this is going to be a rough spell. This is going to be hard. And joining with those people. Things to never say to people. And I say never. And I know often don't say never. Um, you should not to say to someone, I know how you feel, even if you've experienced bereavement, because you never know how they feel. It is not good for an outside person to say it's good that this was quick. It was his time to go. Let's talk about something else. Don't avoid it if somebody wants to talk. Or to say it's good that you're alive. These are not things, and they're things that come out because people want to comfort someone who's who's had a, a cute loss. Your job is to listen. Your job is to say, yeah, that, that, that I'm here to listen. That's what it is. You might ask a survivor if they have a religious or spiritual need because often there are clergy in disaster sites and you could refer them to a clergy member of their choice. Don't judge, contradict, or correct what they say about their religious beliefs. And I, you know, that can be hard. I had a really hard time in uh, Haiti uh, with this because many people believe that the earthquake was due to sinners. And instead I, I did a lot of explaining, well, that may be the case, but let me tell you about what we know about earthquakes and platelets. And you know, I explained what an earthquake was. If survivors want to pray, maybe you can find a place to help them have a suitable place. But people have spiritual needs 
and finding out if they do. And if they don't, not forcing it either. But that's really important. So again, thinking about safety and comfort in different ways, what is it that people need? Now, there are some cases where people do need to be stabilized, where somebody needs to be calmed or oriented or when they're really distraught. And here are signs that somebody needs some kind of stabilization. They may be glassy-eyed and vacant looking, that thousand yard stare. They might be really uh, unresponsive. So you might see this kind of vacant numbness. You might also see the other side of it, people who are really disoriented or exhibiting re really strong emotional responses, hearing incredible shrieks, uh, people who are in, in in some kind of pain, or people who are frantically searching. And I'm going to teach you a couple of tips about what to do in each of those cases. But in each of those cases, you probably want to try to get that person in some way into private area. You might also want to be gentle with the way that you engage with them, give them a few minutes without active attempts to intervene, but be calm and present with them, do something with them, and then say, you know, I'll be available or I'll check back with you in a few minutes. So I would use my judgment in these kinds of cases. Um, if the person is sort of vacant and quiet, I would probably just sit with them and say something like, looks like you're having a rough time. I'm going to just sit with you. Is that okay? And I would observe and see if I could slowly bring them back. Uh, I might say things like, and I'll talk about grounding in a minute, like, notice the temperature in here or I might try to do things to ground them and I'll show you that skill. If they're really frantically moving around, I'm, I'm sitting down. But what I will do with someone who is really frantic is I will start walking with them and I will start walking with them as they're walking frantically. I'll say, may I, may I walk with you? And I may not even talk to them. And as they start to walk, I will start walking and I will try to walk just a little bit slower and try to get the pace so that they're walking a little less frantically and invite them again permission. May I speak with you? What are, and I would just try to get them to talk. I might offer support and focus on specific manageable feelings, thoughts, or goals. Oh, yes, I, I see that you're really upset. I'm just here, I'm gonna sit with you while, while you express that. Oh, I noticed that, oh, it sounds like you wanna talk, but you're having trouble. Can, would you be okay with you if, if we did some breathing exercises? Oh, is there anyone here who you know? Is your family around? Is there someone I can find to, to help you? There's a child or adult that they're with. Oh, this is your mom? Oh, I see. What do you usually do when, when your mom's not feeling so good? Directly addressing their concern, giving them any kind of information that orients them. Yes, the firefighters are over there putting out the fire. We're over here. We're over here, and here's what's going to happen next. If the person needs some orientation, we do something we call grounding. That's the jargon word. But the idea is to feel the ground. So that's how you can remember that jargon word. You might ask the person to, hey, look at me. Or, oh, look at that. Over there, so-and-so is doing that, and this group's doing this over here, and this group's doing over there. Oh, look, those people are trying to help with such and such. Oh, and there's a hospital. There's the medic trying to help out here. I also, when I see people who are really upset, I'll take exaggerated breaths with the hope that people will follow that. I might say, oh, it looks like you're really upset. Is it okay? May I try to help you calm down a little bit? Okay. Are you willing to try that something with me? Okay. I'd like you to name five non-distressing things that you see. Okay. You see the ground over there. You see the trees. Now I'm doing five things you hear, five things you feel, sensations. And you have to be careful. You know, I've done this in the context of, of house fires with the Red Cross. And sometimes you really have to have the person orient them the other direction from the fire or they're talking about distressing things. Younger kids, you might say, hey, let's let's see. Maybe we could look, look at some colors. What What's red? Or, or can you tell me what colors you see? And... If the uh, area is secure and the person really seems disoriented, you might need some a medical consult. It all depends, again, on the situation. 
Um, again, for those of you who are journalists, you can use some of these techniques as well when you're trying to talk to someone. I really want to get some information from you. It sounds like you're having trouble breathing. Would be okay if we took some deep breaths together before I ask you a few questions. Okay, it sounds like you, you know, so you can use those things. I often also suggest to journalists as a technique for interviewing that they take exaggerated breaths so that person may calm down with them. Um, it's important to ask people some things um, and make sure that they understand those things. So you don't always have to stabilize because not everybody needs stabilization, but you might notice. You might notice it, and you might notice people who are also um, just at the scene that seem to be uh, getting other people upset. So you don't always stabilize. You only do that if it's needed. And if you and it isn't often needed, but having those sort of um, techniques are helpful. And I'd say that they're also helpful for certain roles for first responders. If you're trying to get information, if you're trying to provide medical care, just knowing how to do a few of those things might actually help you while you're doing your function in sort of de-escalating that situation. So that's stabilization. Now let's go to information gathering. One of the roles here is to figure out, okay, what does the person need? And what can I do for them? And do I need to refer them somewhere? Do I need to think about future referrals? What component is going to be helpful for them? So the idea here is you're not getting a ton of information. It's like, okay, I need to figure out what does this person need and what do they need now? So I'm going to now give you some things that you might need to know, but this is not a deep interview. You might be thinking about, okay, are they physically hurt? Do they need a doctor? When I say nature and severity of experiences, you do not need to know all the details, but you do want to know, were they in the blast radius? Are, are there scars on them that might need medical attention? That's all you want to need to know is, oh, I see you're here. Were you hit? That's all you need to know. Um, are you concerned about someone? Did someone close to you die? Those are the things you want to know. You don't need the details. Um, are you worried right now about something in the environment? You know, is there an active shooter still there, for example? Are they separated from someone that they're concerned about? Are there ongoing illnesses? So the, one of the ways that I started to learn about um, prior to the, actually the evolution, we didn't even have psychological first aid when I did this, is I used to go out on fire calls with the Red Cross in Boston, in a, in a city. Um, and what I ended up doing, and I was so sort of surprised, is I went in with the designated person um, when it was safe to do so and help people get their, their medicines. And lo and behold, because I know a little bit about, um, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't know that much about medicine, but I know what medicines are offered for what illnesses. I would be the person who would then figure out, oh, that person might have a mental health issue looking at their medication. Oh, I see that, you know, do you have medications that you need? Oh, you have an uncontrolled this disorder. Oh, so you don't have access to your medications. All right, we need to make sure that you can get access to your medications. So even just finding out those kinds of things. And what losses incurred as a result? Do they need something? Do they have, you know, are there papers they need? What, are, what is it that they need? Again, you do not have to do a full assessment, but it's like it's just understanding in this situation, what is it that they need and what is the information that's going to be important? You are not asking for in-depth descriptions of what happened to them. You're basically saying, okay, I'm here. What is it that you need? And you're not asking them to tell you details. You are basically trying to figure out simply as possible what is it they need now? Now, if people want to talk about their experiences, it's perfectly fine to say, I'm willing to listen. But right now, you know, what I really need is basic information to figure out what do you need right now. And in the future, you'll have a lot of chance to talk about your experiences. But here, I'm not going to, you know, my job is to figure out what do you need now. So sometimes people will want to repeat or say what happened because they're still making sense of it. And it is. It's okay to witness that, uh, but you do want to get the person to, you know, out of that phase when they can. Okay. Um, so it's just getting information. 
once you know what the person needs, then it's a matter of figuring out what assistance can you offer in the setting that you're in? What practical assistance? What's the most important need? What can they do? And also, this is the time that I like people to think again about efficacy. What you want to try to convey while you're doing this is that the person has the solutions and the person is able, you know, to ask for help and to get help and to address that need. So here is an example. You're working at a family support center at the airport and there's been a fatal plane crash and family members of the deceased are just arriving. What is it that you would do practically? Well, you might be figuring out what are the lodging needs of those people? Okay, you're waiting to hear information. Do you have a place to stay tonight? Okay, let's see if we can help you with that. Do you have water? Have you eaten today? Okay. Uh, do you need information about death notification or body? Do you need to know how, how folks are working here? Uh, do you have any spiritual needs that will help you for the next few minutes? Um, you might be thinking about, okay, I need to get information on remains back home as pe for those people who are going to have to deal with remains. Oh, you might want to start thinking about, oh, maybe I have some tips or tools I can get for parents because parents here are going to have to tell their kids about death. So you're starting to think about what are the practical things that in that situation, somebody who's providing the psychological support would need to give. Do you have a question? I was going to say, so, so looking at that, something that interests me is it's not only about identifying things that you can help them with directly. Like I might not have the skills to to find accommodation or to to do any of those things, but it's about identifying that list of needs. And then my role as, in the kind of the PFA structure is, all right, this is at least the list of needs. And then I can go and communicate them to the center command or to somebody else who can help them. But at least then we know what the needs are. So it's just kind of I, I don't have to have those resources myself, but at least I can take a list of what people are asking for. Right. And, and again, not promising either saying, okay, it sounds like we need to get lodging. I don't know. What, I don't have that information, but I am going to start the, the ball rolling about how we can get you lodged. Oh, oh, you have a kid, you, you know, we're going to need to talk to. Okay. I'm going to need to tell someone that we need an expert on who talks to kids about bereavement, or maybe I do. I, I happen to have those skills, but the next person doesn't. S something that you raised. Sorry, my network froze a bit there. Yeah, and I it's me or you. Efficacy and trying to connect me. You are not the therapist. Anybody who has problem solving skills can be a psychological first aid provider because that is what your job is. You don't have to be the emotional support. You are the helper in the situation. Sorry, carry on with the slides. I'm going to, my, my internet went a bit wobbly there, but that I was, I, that was okay. great what you said. That was perfect. And you really want small goals. You want achievable goals. How are you going to help the person who's feeling a failure and unable to cope? You know, everybody has a little breakdown now and again. When I was working at a uh, support center uh, in a few days again after um, Katrina, there was a teacher who's turned to me and said, you know, I am in my community. I'm the person everyone goes to. I'm not used to getting support. This is really weird to me. I don't have clothes. I'm kind of emotionally falling apart. And I was just like, it's okay. So you, you've all, you know what, what it's like to, you know, give help. Now you need, you know, for a little bit, you're going to receive help. What helped? What did you tell people? I just went to, when people needed your support, what did you do for them? Okay. So it sounds like that's what you need to do for yourself. And again, what I was communicating was that that person had that efficacy. I understand this is a hard place to be, but you know what it needs. Did you pity the person you helped? No. So how can we, how can we reverse that for you? What is it that will make you feel in control? What did you give to other people? Okay. So let's see how we can do that with you. So really being that straightforward, uh, but doing it in a way that, again, gives people a sense of mastery. That is what practical assistance is. It is really not mental health, but it could be. It could be saying, here's some information, but it is really about what is the practical assistance. And so you don't have to be a mental health specialist 
You need to know what to do and not to overpromise. Now, the other thing, the two pieces that most people may need, sometimes it's connection with so social support and sometimes it's information on coping. We're going to talk about connection with social support. Here, it's to establish brief or ongoing contacts with the primary support person, family members and friends, or other folks. So usually during a disaster, one of the most important things is you want to tell your family you're okay, or you want to find out if your family members are okay. How do you help people connect? So that's some of figuring out how to make that happen. So you want to enhance access to the primary support people. It may be that you have a cell phone that you help somebody make a phone call with. It may be that you find out where cell phones are. It may be that cell phone service is disconnected, so you need to figure out another way for people to speak. It may be that, okay, here's this person. They can help you. Um, it turns out in research that social support is kind of the best thing for mental health, and it's not only giving, uh, receiving support, but giving support can be helpful. So sometimes in a situation, I might actually ask a, a survivor to help somebody else if it's safe, if there are no legal issues. So that might be important. You want to think about who are the potential support people. Um, if somebody is not wanting social support, you might want to talk to their reluctance about it. And if somebody's really withdrawing, you might want to say, you know, we know that, you know, people who, who lean on other people do better in these situations. What can we do to help you? I used this example previously, but I want to point it out again. You're speaking to an 84-year-old woman. Uh, she reports moving to your town after surviving a flood that destroyed her house. And after living here a year, a house fire just destroyed her new home. And she doesn't want to connect with people because it's not worth it. She's tired. She's exhausted. She feels like she's a burden. What would you do in that role? I'll give you a minute to think about it. This is a tough one. But there's some things to think about. Well, what's your assumptions about 84-year-olds? Don't assume she needs services. She might be a very competent 84-year-old. But you'll be thinking, okay, this person doesn't want to lose their independence. So I want to, again, hope efficacy, control. So I might, you know, find out what are her strengths and interests. Um, this is someone who doesn't want to, well, it sounds like you don't need help, but you know, right now we have a group of children over there and they could really use someone. Can you read? Would you be willing to tell them a story and I'll come back in 20 minutes? Would you tell them a story to keep them occupied? That's a way to get somebody to use support without that. Um, and maybe, you know, they don't want emotional support. Well, it sounds like right now what you need is you need some help uh, with getting the belongings out of your house. Can I have somebody help you do that? And then find that group. So, again, just thinking about what can you do that's practical. And you don't have to get into deep issues about independence or all of that. It's like, okay, so either there's something they may be able to do or there might be a tangible way to help that person. Yeah, that sounds like it's a really unfortunate Okay, so do you need anything from your house? Can we get someone to help you? Or, well, it sounds like right now you don't need anything, uh, but I'm wondering if you would help somebody else out. So thinking about creative ways to connect that person. And I'll just uh, make a note here too, you know, that sometimes in the course of these things, talking to a journalist could be helpful in this way. And again, it's not journalist jobs to offer support, but sometimes if a journalist would ask a survivor something like, what is it that you want other people to know about your situation right now? Or what is the most important thing you would tell someone who's in your situation in the future? That is a way, that is a question that might be newsworthy, again, depending on your story, but it also is a question that gives that person a sense of respect and efficacy. So there are ways in which when I train journalists about what to do on disaster sites, there are ways to ask questions that can be empowering um, again, and give choices that don't interfere with coping, which is the way I would think about it for a journalist's role. Their job is not to enhance coping, but it's not to interfere with coping. So I'll just mention that. And now we're on to coping. Now, this is an area where there's lots of handouts, and it may be really helpful to tell people some information about coping and to provide information about stress reactions and things to think about. 
So um, one thing to do is to say, okay, here's what we know right now. We know that there's uh, some toxic exposure in the air, uh, that they're working on it. Here's what we know. Or we don't know how many people are dead, but we know this. Okay, here's what we have in place right now. We have this area over here. We have this area over here. There's a place that you can go if you need a place to sleep tonight. Here's, there's a, a, you know, a service over there. So what you know, you provide information about. Are you aware that there are people coming around giving water? You might say to someone, you know, what we have found out is that people who have experienced a flood, well, the first few nights, they really have a lot of trouble sleeping and then usually it gets better. You know, one of the things that we found out is that people may increase the, uh, the degree to which they smoke cigarettes uh, for the first couple of days, and then it goes back to normal. So you want to make keep an eye on it. Or, you know, one thing that you might want to be aware of is, you know, it's not the best idea to do a lot of drinking right now or smoking marijuana. Sometimes that can make it worse at the beginning. If that's something you do, you may want to think about it or at least monitor not doing a whole bunch. Oh, you know, kids sometimes after a bad event like this, um, they want to, they may have learned to, you know, sleep in a, a separate bed and now um, they want to sleep in your bed. That's perfectly normal. Or you want to try to get back to family routines as much as possible. Or, oh, you know, sometimes we find out that it's a kid's birthday, uh, the event that happened and that they're, what they're really upset about is that their birthday party is canceled, not that their house burned down. So, you know. What is it that you can do to make your, your child feel special for tomorrow when it's their birthday? So thinking about information on coping, providing simple information about stress reactions and coping, and talking about negative and positive, not talking about these difficulties, but just sort of saying, you know, here's some things that we found to be helpful. Here's some things we found not to be so helpful. And, you know, not telling everybody everything, but saying, oh, you know, I noticed that you're a little shaky. Being shaky is a common thing. It usually goes away, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, you may want to mention to people, you know, here are some things that we've noticed people do after a mass disaster. You might want to keep an eye on it. If you notice yourself withdrawing, if you notice yourself avoiding thinking about it all the time or talking about it all the time, those are some, you know, red flags that you might need to, you know, do something. Or if you notice that you're working nonstop to avoid thinking about it, and that's not like you, you may want to think about it. You notice yourself more angry or violent. You notice yourself frequently wanting to use alcohol or drugs. That's something, you know, to keep an eye on. It's negative coping. Here are some things we found that are positive coping. Uh, social support, finding some distracting activities, setting some goals and meeting them, changing your expectations or priorities right now. Okay, this may not be the time to do such and such. Remembering that it's important to breathe and relax and to rest. You know, if you can do some exercise and that's helpful to you, you might in the future need counseling, you might not. Um, what we know from studies on rape, by the way, is that most spontaneous uh, recovery occurs um, during the first month and then at three months. So what I often talk to people after sexual assault and say, you know, you can seek therapy, you cannot seek therapy, that's up to you. What we know is if if at three months you're still having a lot of trouble, that's a point that you might want to check in with a, with a mental health provider. You might tell people things like, you know, react, how long reactions last really depend. It depends on how much you've been exposed to this thing, how much loss you have, and loss is associated with long-term difficulty. Um, how, how crazy things are in the next couple weeks for you um, and how often you're reminded of things. So it, it sort of depends, you know. Um, again, right on site, you might not do this, but you might want to talk about the um, impact of trauma, loss, and change reminders, and there's some tip sheets on it. You know, what are things that will remind you of this event, and what are some things, strategies you can use? So often, for example, there's a car accident. I'm going to talk about an individual. Getting into that car after you've had a car accident can be scary. It's actually one of best things you can do is get back in the car for some mastery but okay here's some things breathe okay remember you can you can manage this it's not happening again but helping people think about it and there are tip sheets at the back of the book that talk about that a trauma reminder is something that reminds you and can evoke upsetting thoughts or feelings 
loss reminders, and those of you who've experienced death might know that, or bring to mind the absence of a loved one. And there are also change reminders, which are things that remind the survivor how life has changed as a result of a disaster. Um, kids can regress. Um, that can happen after a disaster, and I mentioned that already. Um, you might want to ask, which you don't think about it, about those special events. Hey, is there something the family was looking forward to? Starting school, marriage, birthdays, um, and making parents aware that, you know, or other family members of the impact of interrupting that loss. Those can be bigger things. And they're, you know, seeing if you can find a birthday cake or seeing if you can, um, you know, think about a way to designate marriage. This is something that comes up sometimes in shelters. You're working in a shelter and you see a couple arguing. The male is getting louder and louder and thrusting his fist in the air. And it could be a woman too. Survivors nearby are getting anxious. Um, and somebody may say, can you stop shouting? And he gets even more loud. What do you do? This is a tricky situation. Um, but a psychological first aid responder could do something like, you know, suggesting there's a timeout or cool down. You might figure out if there's a friend there and say, hey, maybe you can talk to a friend. Uh, you might suggest some exercise. Why don't you go take a quick run and come back? Why don't you write down how you're feeling? But you want to think about, you know, how can you help de-escalate that situation? You might just sort of say, you know, this is so hard. There's so many things to be angry about. Let's see if you can take a deep breath, you know, because right now this may not be the case that what you want to do. Maybe we can distract you for a little bit. Uh, maybe we can bring a kid in. So you want to try to de-escalate some of that anger. Was there something that you wanted to add or say? I, w I wanted to ask, but we can also talk about this at the end, is this information on coping is we're thinking about the survivors and the victims. And I'm also thinking about how do we translate this information for the responders themselves? Because at the same time, they're they're performing their job as responders. Maybe they're trying to also do psychological first aid, but they're also you often exposed to some level of trauma because you're seeing people very upset. Maybe you've seen something very violent, or whatever it is. So, uh, but, but again, we can talk about this now or at the end when you finished your your choice. Let's talk about it at the end because I'm I have a little bit of a focus on that at the end as well. Okay, great. So let's let's do that there. Um. Another thing that a psychological first aid person can do, and this sort of relates to your question too, is to clarify any misunderstandings, rumors, and distortions. There are lots of rumors that come by, people think of things, um, people are looking for information. So it's really important to try, well, you know, I don't know if that's verified or not, let's find out. Uh, let's not repeat it till we know what's going on. Okay. And the same thing for saying, you know, thoughts can affect how you feel. So let's think about what you're thinking about. Um, and identify and offer other ways of looking at the situation that are less upsetting. Now, of course, if you lost your house, you've lost your house. There's nothing about that that's going to make it less upsetting. But it is important to focus on, you know, you've lost your house, but you're alive. You know, those two words are true. So let's, you know, focus on you're alive. Now, what's the next step that you need to think about? Um, sleep problems often occur after disaster, and it's important to just remind people, you know, it's going to be rough, but it, as much as you can, keep to, you know, your sleep routines, uh, try not to drink too much, try not to have a lot of, you know, pop in the middle of the day. Um, if you can, you know, exercise, if you can relax, you can, you know, limit your naps before, four, you know, 4 p.m. ish. Um, get support, you know, sleep is, is an issue. So try to proactively think about sleep. Um, think about, you know, your kids might want to remain close to their parents at night and that changes in sleep patterns are okay. One of the things that I was shocked by when I, I actually went to Haiti to work with journalists uh, and people after um, the earthquake were afraid to be indoors. So everybody was sleeping outside for the aftershocks. Um, but one of the things that puzzled me was that actually nobody had actually talked to their children about the aftershocks. They hadn't talked about, this was really scary. We're sleeping outside to keep you safe. They had just not talked to their children. And I ended up doing a lot of public health around kids' needs, and parents just didn't know what to say to their kids. They felt so bad that they hadn't been able to keep them safe that they just chose silence. 
And so there was sort of a conspiracy of silence around things and just even helping parents say, you know, it's important to talk to your kids. Okay, if this ever happens again, here's where we'll try to meet. This will be our family safety spot. Or um, the reason we're sleeping outside is we are scared to be inside and it's safer to be in a tent outside. Or, you know, here are some things that I do to make myself feel better. I've talked a little bit already about alcohol and substance abuse. Explain that many survivors choose to drink, use medications or drugs to reduce their bad feelings. Um, there are pros and cons to doing that. Um, and so let's, you know, think about that. And again, that's something probably more of a mental health person. But this is very different, again, from therapy. It's just saying, yeah, of course, some people are going to increase. That may be okay for you. Let's just go through what's good or bad. Have you had a problem in the past? Is that something to worry about? Is that not something to worry about? Okay, when would you know if it's a problem? How would you anticipate if it was a problem or versus what's normal for you and just fine? And there are lots of tip sheets on coping at the back of this book. And then finally, um, depending on where you are and what the situation is, you may want to link that person with ongoing services immediately or in the future. So whether that's mental health, whether that's spiritual, whether it's medical, whether it's alternative healers, whether it's child welfare services, schools, drug and alcohol support groups, whatever the case is in your community is thinking about, okay, well, here's some information for you. Here's what we know. Here's, you know, where you can go to get your documents. Uh, here's, you know, the legal services you need. But being able to think about in this situation, I don't have this now, but these are some things that you may need for services, particularly when people are befuddled, like, oh my God, there's so much I have to do right now. What is it that I need to do? Sometimes you might want to make a mental health referral, particularly for mental health folks. Um, and the tips that we have here is suggesting an evaluation. Hey, you know, you may want to check in. There's a lot of stigma about mental health. You may want to check in with a, a mental health professional and you may want to do it. Not, I'm not saying only treatment, but maybe just an evaluation, like a checkup. You know, we find that people who after disasters, they need that just like you need a shot sometimes uh, for your health. You might provide them with educational information or different ways to get assistance. Um, sometimes you can involve a person's spouse or partner in the discussion. Sounds like you're really resistant to that, but you know, so on and so if they're sitting there, you know, you may want to, you know, check up with this person. Um, you know, would it be okay if I called you, but then you have to really do this and not everybody does this, but in some situations, can I call you in five days and check on you? Some people don't do that. Sometimes it, the sites don't allow for that, but you could follow up. Or is it okay if I tell another person, this is for shelter, I'm going to tell another person, can they check in on you in a couple of days? Now, we already talked very briefly about this, but um, usually in every community, there's some kind of structure like this. This is the structure that, that's used by the Red Cross, but there can be other structures that make sense in your community your township in the area that you live in thinking about how would we respond? Who's the incident commander? Who's the public information officer? Who's the safety officer? How do these things work? Or who does operations? You know, the things. But thinking about sort of in your community, how does this all fit together? And usually the mental health folks fit under, sometimes they're under medical, sometimes they're underground support, those kinds of things. My friend, my, uh, the director of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, which is a center that I work for, for the ethical coverage of, um, of trauma in the news, uh, Bruce Shapiro, you know, he showed, I don't have the slide with me, but when we do work with journalists, um, this is the way that most systems think, okay, the public information officer gives information to journalists. But we made our own slide of what journalists think, and journalists, the public information officer is just one source. So are the survivors, so are all the people who are on site. Uh, they have a very different map. So that's something So just to think about is that your incident command structure is not what the uh, people who you are working with or the journalists, for example, or other community members necessarily are operating under the same assumption. So the more, again, you can do pre-planning, the better. Are there any questions on just the introductions? So usually um, there are a lot of online, if you go to the Child Traumatic Stress Network, 
there's a fuller online uh, um, training. And I'll show you again that uh, website at the end of this presentation. But you can sign up for more hours. There's lots of training with lots of examples where you could really go in deep and get some of these tools. But my goal today was just to introduce you to those. Um, since we didn't have time. Do you have any questions in general before I talk a little bit about provider care? No, I think let's go into the, I think the provider care will be fantastic. And and I think that's also a really important part and often neglected. We see that particularly with journalists. Um, when I say- You're going in and out with your- Oh, okay. Let me turn my video off. Um, as I say, we often see the- we, so we hear, we're hearing every other word. Turn, turn off your screen for a minute. So let's see if you're you. Okay. Let's try again. And hopefully this one will work. Um, there's a lot of attention being paid. To oh, now my internet connection is unstable. Oh, <laughs> maybe turn off your screen for a second. We'll, we'll, um, cause it, you know, have you tried switching it on and off again? Um, I'm sure we'll get there. Um, so we, you can just turn off your video and maybe that will, anyway, I think you're fine. I can sort of see you moving. Um, let's go into the yeah, provider gonna... care and we'll, t we'll talk after that. Let's do the provider care. Oh. I'm going to stop my video for a minute. Can you hear me better? I can hear you and I can see your slides. That's great. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about provider care. <coughs> and all of you in roles, and it's really important that you take care of yourselves. And we had a very, very, I think, compelling conversation about strategies for taking care of yourself. But I think it's important in each of your roles is to think about sort of the management from a provider care. Should there be a rotation when people move from the exposed assignments to other exposure? And that sort of depends, again, in your planning. Differences in your role where you go over things. Is there an opportunity? Are you in a learning environment where you practice and you take care of yourselves? And if you are setting up those structures, how can you make them more effective? Um, or is there a model at high risk for these kinds of things? Um, is stress management practices part of something that you practice regularly? because it really is important in these roles, you are an important instrument and it's important that you take care of yourself. So I think management has a role and that's gonna vary again by every service. Um, many, of the help, many of the first responder services are really good at this. Journalism, we're, we work with managers and sort of thinking about these things in helping journalists, but not every group does this. The same thing is true for uh, first response, um, for, for PFA providers, ways that people can get consultation and supervision. Um, when I was helping out with this from a management perspective, we would at the end of the day have a kind of checkout service. Okay, so thank you very much for, for volunteering today. Let's just go through what was the hardest thing you did today? What are you most proud of? And even just helping someone put in form sort of what were you most proud of that you did today? What was most frustrating today? What is the one thing you'd want to tell someone else that you learned today? To Making those principles of hope, efficacy, and just, you know, asking people about that at the end of their day. I think there's also personal things that people can do. Now, again, you have an important job to do, but is it possible to limit daily numbers of the most severe cases after the worst part is done? Do you have a buddy system that you can share with your team or a person? Um, do you take time, vacation time and personal time when you're not working? Do you have access to a supervisor that you can talk to? Do you practice stress management during the workday? Are you aware of your limitations and needs? Um, it's really important that providers make every effort to avoid working too long by themselves without checking in or working around the clock with few breaks. Um, if you hear yourself feeling like you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, 
Is that a message that you need to change? I'm doing the best I can. Uh, are you jacked up on sweets and caffeine? So it's important to think about that. Thinking about some of those thoughts in your own head, it would be selfish to take time to rest. I hear that a lot. Well, if you've been on for five days in a row and there is another team that can do your job, it's time for you to take a break. Others are working around the clock, so should I. Well, yes, others are, but do, is there someone else who can do what you're doing? And if so, it's important to rest. The needs of survivors are more important than the needs of helpers. I hear that a lot. Well, that's not true, actually. Helpers actually need to help survivors in the long run. We don't want you to burn out. I can contribute the most by working all the time. Well, that's not true. You may start making mistakes. I get very worried when I hear a first responder say, only I can do X, Y, and Z. Well, what you do is very special, but you have a team of providers who are trained. It's hard for me to believe that no one else can do something. And if you're coping and saying that you're the only one who can do that, very rare circumstances is that you're the only one in the team available after the first 24 hours who can do whatever it is that you do. I'm not saying you're not important. I'm just saying that you need to watch what you say to yourself um, because that sets you up for failure. Um, if you are deployed, it can be difficult coming back home. It can be difficult not having all of that excitement. It's important for you to talk with your coworkers and management. If you start to have extreme stress and it persists, it's important for you to reach out. You take care of yourself. If you are more irritable, it's important to ask for help in parenting uh, to make sure that's okay or if you have trouble adjusting. Um, this work changes the way you see the world. You may be always looking for danger um, and that may be hard for other people in your lives. So it's important for you to also see the beauty in life and the safety in life and to remember that there are beautiful things in the world. And it may be important for you to increase experiences that have spiritual or philosophical meaning to you. Talked a lot about the importance when we're talking about resiliency of feeling connected to something greater, if that's spiritual, if that's nature, if that's philosophical. Um, and many of you had identified things that give your set, you a sense of purpose and meaning. But I think it's important to have a purpose and meaning beyond responding solely to disasters that helps you because that really can help you through a difficult time. So my take home messages are to use this flexible, pragmatic approach specific to the need, context, and phase of recovery. You don't have to do everything, but thinking about that. There's lots in the field operations guide for detailed information. It's really important for you to take care of yourself and your colleagues. And what I haven't talked about, I am at root, I'm a, a professor, I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm a journalist ally. Um, for me, evidence is really important. Evidence is how we improve the field. And I think it's really important in all of your roles to document what you do well and to try to have as many outcomes as you can, because then we can work together to respond to all of these disasters and share them across international lines, those kinds of things. I mentioned, you know, that many communities do innovative things. So I mentioned when I met with you that in Australia during the bushfires that rescue workers were really getting tired of journalists because journalists would go out, they'd cover the story, and then they'd get stuck in the fire and there'd be another another person that the first responders would have to deal with. Well, they came up with this brilliant idea that all journalists who cover bushfires now have to go through bushfire training. And that has ended up in reducing the number of journalists who have who get who get caught. In fact, since they required this, they're no longer a hassle for first responders. And it was a brilliant sort of solution that came from a community. And I think that documenting these kinds of things, okay, so what is it that gets in the way? And then how what are the solutions? And sharing that with other communities um, can really be helpful in moving things forward. So the psychological first aid, uh, uh, PFI guide again, is available, it's hard to read this, at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. You could say psychological first aid, traumatic stress network or psychological first aid 
uh, the National Center for PTSD, and they have all those appendices and things that I think that might be helpful. I'm going to stop there, and maybe we can have a conversation, um, and I'll put on my video as well. I am having a unstable internet connection, okay. so hopefully that won't be a problem. We will see how we go. Um, and thank you for that. And I'm really glad that we managed to get through the slides because I think, you know, we started them during the workshop and it really does tie it all together when you actually bring that information in. And really helpful from the perspective of a journalist, but also you mentioned the word earlier as a citizen or a civilian and um, or maybe as a citizen. And I think journalists, we often imagine that we straddle this line between we're not really a civilian. We kind of have some special something. Um, but I think what's also important to consider in the South African context is that journalists and many other civil society organizations are involved in disaster responses. And sometimes I think we have to be practical about this. It's because of shortcomings on the state's part where they haven't planned enough or there aren't enough resources. But the point is that we often have multiple organizations and organizational structures, all meaning well, but coming into a situation, into an incident. And, you know, we're going to often we haven't trained together. We haven't done disaster planning together. So we have to learn how to uh, deal with things uh, in a united way. So I think that this is a really important guide for especially flattening those individual differences in the response team. And I also think it highlights perhaps in our own planning is that we are so often focused on the, the triage part. We're so often focused on the immediate response of, you know, life-saving and stabilization that we don't imagine what happens next. And when I say what happens next, I mean in the few hours after in the and in the day after. And this is really where PFA comes into being, which is the, the person is no longer, you know, they have it, the tourniquet has been applied. Um, the, the bus is no longer dangling off the edge of the cliff. So, so the disaster is, has ended or halted or mostly ended, or there's some level of safety. And in that immediate aftermath, and, and I think so few of us plan for, yeah, you know, what happens after the disaster, journalists and even emergency responses. So it's incredibly and people useful. are still in that, and people are still in that phase biologically where they're saying danger, danger, danger. Their bodies are still in danger. The responders are still in danger mode. And what we need to do is help people calm and plan for that period yeah. once that's there. Um, and it's a very difficult period because your body is not aligned with the situation and you need to figure out what those next steps are. So I absolutely agree. Two things that you mentioned during the workshop, maybe they'll be the last questions I ask because I don't want to, to drag, you know, to go on too long, but two things I think are important. One is um, I think you mentioned that sort of the, the that does that danger, danger response is perfectly natural, but also we have to sort of try and not linger too much on that. Um, and, and I think that for first responders in particular, it's really important because your, your natural functioning zone is in danger, danger. When you are, as soon as the danger has subsided or there's no danger, well, it's boring or there's nothing to do. So this tells us that there is something to do and that there's a structured way to approach it that de-escalates. What was it that, that, that sort of, um, it's, I, I wrote it down at the time and I don't have my notes now, but that arousal, right? So it, it keeps you in, in that constant state of arousal and we want to sort of reduce that for our own well-being, but also so that we can manage other people. We need to accept that doing what we think are maybe menial things, getting somebody a cup of water or asking a very you know basic practical question is not a downgrade, even though you're a paramedic or you're a rescue person. It's like those things are really meaningful immediately after the event. And then there was this important thing that you mentioned about the being able to control so having you and you mentioned it today as well that sometimes you need to create a narrative to structure some meaning so so that creating meaning allows you to understand the event so maybe if we could we look at maybe I'm throwing a curveball here but how how does this trauma response and how does this arousal how can we turn that into a narrative that helps to give us meaning but that we don't have to be caught up in it. Well, let me start with first responders. I think that for first responders, I want you in a state of arousal when I'm in an emergency. When my car goes off the cliff, man, I'm glad you're there. Like, I need you and I don't want you 
uh, in a comp state. I want you to take care of my primary needs and put me back together. So thank you. But what I do think for you is that you need to learn to be able to go into that high zone and then go into that low zone, recover, so that you can go back into that high zone. So that is the sort of narrative I would say is that uh, my my dear first responder, I want you to be able to turn it on and then to turn it off, resource yourself so that you can get back on. And that would be the narrative that I would say. And that's why learning those skills of breathing of when it's down, of deregulating, of going back to your families, of doing those kinds of things is really important because it will help you to get back there quickly without having a disruption. So that would be the way I think I would think about that and the stories you tell. And I think it is important um, to think you, it's just sort of like um, you all take care of your equipment and you have your equipment ready, right? You have your life-saving equipment ready with you. Those of you who do the forensic work, you have your equipment ready. Um, and taking care of your equipment is kind of boring, right? But your equipment is there to help you do your work. You are your equipment. So that's another narrative that I would say is that asking someone how they're doing, that's all part of the context and the equipment. And you are part of the phase. And I'm, I'm suggesting that you extend that phase a little bit into asking someone into doing taking care of that work and again just like i would say to a first res to a psychological first aid provider or to a journalist your function is to support the other people but until they get there you may need to do something else right you may need to give life support i would say the same thing to our first responders which is until the psychological support people get there you may need to do a little bit of extending and that's part of being community. And we do know that disasters are mm. part of a community. Okay. And the, the last thing is you mentioned how disasters and trauma disconnect us. And one of those important things, I really like going back to that sort of circle, the five features, and that, that connection yeah. is really key. And so where I'd maybe like to end here is, first of all, by thanking you once again for um, I suppose the input, the insight, um, the guidance, it's so useful for me, even in terms of structuring my, my academic work, my practice in journalism, my work with other journalists, my work with other organizations that do first response type work. It, it's on so many levels. But it's also a reminder as to why we set up this workshop in the first place and why we invited different first responders to participate is your community is your own family, your normal community, but your community is also us. So we are the same community we saw at the workshop that we had in person, how many people had even been at the same event, but didn't know each other at the time because they were covering different parts of it. And so this, more than any other community, really, is a community that will understand what it is like to arrive at a scene of absolute just, you know, tragedy and and not be part of the tragedy and yet have to deal with that aftermath. And so hopefully we can use this as the foundation for strengthening the ties between this community as well, because it is a really important resource and network. And these are people who similarly will understand what it feels like to be in those situations to move in and out of those states of hyper arousal and and you know have to drop back out of it to confront these things on a daily basis and so i think it gives us a really nice way forward to also look at more integrated uh discussions and perhaps as you say more evidence in the future because then we can talk to each other about these types of things and i want to compliment you because i really think you keep saying we and yes i do do this work um, and getting clinicians to work together with disaster providers and getting journalists in the context that I do. But this really was your vision um, for your community. And I see you as such a great connector. Um, and I just want to thank you and say how much I value you and um, how much I value this community and the willingness of people to take risks and engage in this conversation. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Yolana. Right, we're going to stop the recording now. And anybody who has any questions, they're welcome to send me an email at Vitz. The email address is my full name. It's nahamad.brody at vitz.ac.za. Um, we'll be sharing this online. And um, if you have any questions, yeah, please send me a message. And if anybody needs help accessing the PDF of the, the training manual or the website, um, I'll be happy to share that as well. Thank you all for joining us. And people are welcome to email me at the DART Center or at the University of Tulsa as well. And you can find my email easily on the web. 
Absolutely. So Ilana's email addresses are on the websites of her universities. Thank you very much. And the recording ends now. Have a good day wherever you are.